Right, so the original idea that I had was um, what if, and this is going to sound quite similar to um, what's been said before, but what if you could um, use nanotechnology to record someone's experiences and transmit them for another person to experience. And I, and I imagine this is sort of a, um, um, a commercial aspect, so you know, it, it would, these, these memories experiences could be viewed live or could be um, viewed as a backlog, you know, imagine the um, BBC iPlayer, for example, but for experiences. Um, and so, so that's, that's the original idea. And the interesting thing I had to say with um, talking to Stuart today has been actually the social aspect. Because, you know, the differences this would make to um, the people doing the experiencing, you know, how would you experience someone else's memory? Would, you, would, you, would it replace all your senses completely and would you be going in with sort of um, a trance or would you keep some vestige of yourself and, and think about it while you were experiencing these things? Um, and I think one of the most um, one of the most important achievements that um, we've done today was to motivate this technology. It's all very well coming up with a poor sciencey idea, and you know that would make a great story, which is all I did at the beginning. But um, <laughs> um, the interesting thing was talking about, okay, why would you want to do this? Why would you want, you know, why would people want to have their experiences recorded? Um, why would you want to, why? You know, be that invasive and, and view someone else's experiences that would be a bit seem quite alien and, and unpersonal. Um, and uh, Stuart's going to explain some of that um, motivation and the, some of the things behind that, the social stuff. Um, whenever I watch science fiction films or read science fiction novels, my first question is always why? And I'm always wondering why someone might do something or why someone would invent such a thing. What's, what's the rationale behind it? And uh, when I was thinking about the idea of technology and the interaction that we have with technology, one of the things that I was thinking about a lot is the fact that the things that really work, the things that are incredibly successful, things like uh, the internet, Twitter, um, uh, Facebook, they just amplify our sense of what it is to be human. They just make it easier for us to do things that we want to do. So in terms of the internet, it's just like having all of the libraries in the whole world just at your fingertips. So it makes it easier for you to do things or to extract knowledge. Twitter gives you an, uh, an opportunity to be able to communicate with more people. It gives you an opportunity to show off. It gives you an opportunity to stroke your ego. It gives you an opportunity to get a hug when, when you really need it and there's no one around to actually give it to you. So that was my kind of starting point with this idea for this nanotechnology idea. What, how would someone use it once it's become normalised, what Julian was saying about once you've become, it's just second nature in the same way that you know you, you type on your phone that you know that ten years ago you wouldn't have even had a phone, let alone having typed on it. You know that, that those kinds of ideas. So I took as an idea the fact that we're also coming into a period where people want to be um, not quite as fearful as the kind of frightening world in which we live. So I came up with an idea of um, a kind of uh, shameless. Nick from uh, JG Ballard, but the kind of gated communities that we see springing up, particularly in America, in the UK, and in South Africa, where um, people live kind of very insular, protected lives. But the one problem with leading insular, protected lives is that you always want to leave. You always want to experience something that you can't. And that's when I thought that maybe the nanotechnology, like experiencing other people's energies and other, other bodies as a proxy, would be really interesting and people would actually go for that because there's an obvious kind of quid pro quo. I want to be able to go out and have sex with lots and lots of different people, um, and, but I want you to take the risk and here's the fi I'm, there's a financial imperative for you to do that. So there's a kind of rich versus poor, young versus old kind of idea where you can suddenly get back old experiences of going around and being very attractive to the opposite sex, or same sex or whatever, um, or alternatively, it might just be that you, you know, you're, you like, you used to like taking drugs, but you can't take them any longer, or you used to be able to like eating hamburgers, but you can't because your weight's too big, or whatever. Um, and so that's where I took it from. And then, so, and then in my typical mundane writerly way, I decided, well, I don't really want to write about, you know, exciting stuff because I don't <laughs> write about exciting stuff anyway. <laughs> um, so. What's what's the dark what's the dark side of what's the dark side of, of, of that experience? And the thought 
that I, I thought about was that once you've done all the excitement, once you've taken all the drugs and you know had all the sex and all that, what do people crave? What do people want? And I, I thought that there probably exist somewhere online huge subsets of people um, searching around on this huge kind of interface, trying to find the dullest, most mundane people and trying to live a truly boring existence which you know which doesn't mirror their own and this is what I came up with um, so I'm just going to read you the opening bit um, of, of, based on this idea um, well, I've also named it so that I, I call the concept of, of take someone else's experience linking so. he was without a doubt the most boring person she had ever linked it had been an accident she'd even found him he was, she knew now, not much of a reader, physical. At that moment, at that time, she was searching late on a Tuesday night after linking with a woman who knitted a little too furiously. He was reading the operating manual for an old coffee machine. <laughs> she felt him read the words, English, poorly translated, and he was neither stirred by their age and their oddity, nor intrigued by their meaning. He simply read the words and looked at the component parts of the coffee machine. She felt him imagining the coffee machine in its finished state, chrome and glass and plastic. He did not look forward to the task completion. He simply began to follow stages one through five. She added credits and linked to his available memories. He was 22 and had been in the programme since he was 15. There were only a few locations, a small apartment, the hallway and lift to the doorway, three streets and a junk store lockup, a swimming pool, a cafe, a man's house. The places were confined to a square mile from his apartment. There was no indication of travel beyond it, just those places, and most of them infrequently attended. His name was David Rosenberg, unmarried, no lovers, no available information on sexual preference, not a user of porn, not a drinker, not a smoker, no drugs of any description. His guiding rating was zero. D-linked in constructing the coffee machine, him using a manual coffee grinder to grind the beans, filling the machine's reservoir from the tap and then plugging it into an adapter. She anticipated his feeling of satisfaction, the small tingle of interest as the water began to bubble, but there was nothing. <laughs> it was like he was not even there. She licked the smell of the coffee. It was a heady, pleasant smell, but nothing out of the ordinary. He moved from the kitchen to the living area. The flooring was pale laminate. The walls were whitewashed. One screen, one window, one two-seater sofa, one potted plant, one coffee table, one ceiling fan. He sat on the two-seater sofa. She linked the smell of the coffee, the smell of a house cleaned once a week. She linked every thought he had. There were not many. <laughs> I have food enough for tomorrow. The bins must be taken out tomorrow. My swimming shorts are dry. I shall swim tomorrow. I will dine at the cafe tomorrow. The coffee smells like the cafe. A man comes tomorrow for the Dyson. Mr. Martins. He will be interested in the Dustbuster too. I will settle for 2,000 euro. No less. I must call my father. I must. I will do so tomorrow. In the Lincoln she felt something shimmer as Rosenberg thought of his father. Not the usual basso crescendo when you hear reach the core of someone's motivations, but certainly something. A minuscule blip. Then the link went down as he slept. Dee refreshed his feed, but there was nothing. She'd been linking him for three hours. She usually managed no more than 25 minutes. She'd been inside him for three hours and barely had it registered. She understood what this meant. It meant she was in love with David Rosenberg. <laughs> <laughs>